No story is original no matter what anyone tells you because writers are merely the products of their inspiration. But can sometimes homages get in the way of telling a truly great story? Well, that is what I'm going to talk about today along with many other things in my review of Nathan Ballingrud's science fiction debut, The Strange. But first, what is the hook? What is The Strange about? 1931, New Galveston, Mars. 14-year-old Annabelle Crisp owns a small diner along with her father. But when a violent man shows up and causes trouble, driving her father to violence, she must venture across the wastelands to bring back the only thing that will save him. So what did I think? Well, first, let's start with setting because this is an interesting one. Notice I didn't say a unique one because here we are. It's an alternate history. Mars 1931. And this begins the first homage because the late, the great Mr. Ray Bradbury wrote a book called The Martian Chronicles. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Go check it out. It's one of my favorite science fiction books of all time because Ray Bradbury, he wasn't really concerned with scientific accuracy. He wasn't writing a hard science fiction novel or novels. He was merely concerned with the human condition. He was using science fiction or these ideas as a jumping off point for speculation. And that's what he did best. That's what I love about his work so much. So Nathan Ballingrud is in that realm with the story. However, well, I won't get ahead of myself because we're still talking about setting 1931 America shows up here on Mars uh, with in flying saucers. So yeah, a little bit on the nose, but here we are. There is a mysterious ore called the strange where the title comes from, of course. So we have a, a mining community. So again, it's very Western frontier and they're mining this substance, the strange, and it has a little bit of a consequence to it. And that is it turns the miners or if you're around it anyway, it turns your eyes green. This begins our second homage. And if you haven't guessed yet, I'll spoil it for you. It's uh, Frank Herbert's Dune because as you know, or maybe you don't know, on Arrakis, they are mining a substance called the spice, which turns your eyes blue. So here we are already, homage number two. Is it two on the nose for you yet? Don't worry, there are more to come. I know it sounds like I'm trashing on this book already, but I love the setting. Like I said, Western Frontier, miners, there's, there's revolvers, there's a sheriff. The sheriff's name is even Bakersfield, the town I grew up in. It's the most random thing ever. I even looked up the author to see if he was from that area. No, granted, I think there's a few other Bakersfields in the United States, but funny co coincidence nonetheless, it's a simple setting. There's not a lot of characters. There's not a lot of places to go. And if you've been around this channel long enough, you know how much I love a small cast and a small plot. But speaking of Westerns, this brings our third homage, and that is the property True Grit, but not only in setting, but in character and narrative. But let me keep going, talking about the setting a little bit more. There's cultists, which, hey man, I'm a sucker for cultists. But because this novel is told in first person, we're told a lot of things about the setting. We're not shown a lot of things about the setting, which it's inherent to that voice, to that POV. But I was hoping to discover these strange things and this strange things, these mysterious things about the setting, about the novel visually, right? As it was coming across the page, not told to me by the narrator. I was just hoping for a little bit more atmospheric development, even though I really enjoy the setting. So how else has True Grit inspired this novel? Well, let's talk about character. My favorite thing to talk about. We have Annabelle Crisp. She's 14 years old. She owns a diner along with her father on Mars. She's feisty and she has a mouth to match. Does this sound familiar yet? Yes, it sounds like Maddie from True Grit. And not just in spirit, almost in every single way. And this begins my disappointment in the novel. You know, with the setting and the Dune stuff and the Martian Chronicle stuff, I was okay. But then when we really started to get heavy into the character development and the narrative itself, and it felt <laughs> too damn much like True Grit. This is when, like I said, I became disappointed, but I stuck with it. I almost quit this novel actually, but something about the POV because it's told from Annabelle's perspective as an old woman. So I'm thinking to myself, hmm, 
always interested why writers choose certain POVs. And I'm like, there must be a reason. It's going to come full circle. There's going to be some depth of the character. It's going to be meaningful in some way. And so that's why I stuck with it. Unfortunately, it didn't really come together for me in that regard. But more about Annabelle. So I don't remember if Maddie and True Grit like to read, but Annabelle definitely does. And she is very obsessed with Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes. So she names the robot Watson. And he even has a British accent. You may be asking yourself right now, what other robot companion has a British accent? I'll give you a moment. Now, yes, that one came to mind first, but I feel like this is more of an homage to iRobot by Isaac Asimov. And in fact, my suspicions were confirmed at the very end of the book when the writer himself in the afterward mentions Isaac Asimov as being another influence. And that's pretty much all there is developmentally about Annabelle, unfortunately. Uh, the rest of the side characters, there's not much of them either. Her father, the sheriff, the robot, her companions that she goes on this, you know, quote unquote quest with. I was, at the very least, I was hoping for her and her father to have this special connection, this bond, this unspoken language, inside jokes, whatever it was, something to really lay the foundation to make me get behind these characters. But it never happened. It never happened. Her father always just felt like a background character to me. He didn't really do a whole lot. He felt washed up. He felt passive, which, you know, again, maybe that's the point. We do know also that they left her mother behind and his wife. And that brings us to the plot where we have, they're just, you know, they're, they're running this diner and uh, these, these miners come in. They cause some trouble. There's this man named Silas. He steals this canister. So there's a canister of her mother's voice. It's a recording of her mother's voice. And during this confrontation, her father gets violent. He, he gets over the top and he gets thrown in jail by Sheriff Bakersfield. This again, I think plot wise and development wise, I was kind of getting disappointed because I don't want to say this is a revenge story, but it kind of is. I, I thought that her dad was going to die from the very beginning. I'm like, okay, these guys are coming in. They're causing trouble. He's going to get killed. She's going to go on a quest for revenge. He doesn't die, but he gets pushed over the edge. Like I mentioned, he attacks somebody. He gets thrown in jail and she decides to go off and, and retrieve this canister that was stolen because he just says, I, I got to hear her voice again. So really, that's that's the plot. That's that's sort of the impetus for the plot. She's she's going to retrieve this canister to, I guess, bring sanity back to her father while he's in jail. And you know how at the beginning of a revenge story, like a film or something you've seen, the writer, he puts everything in order. He sets it all up for us to feel, for us to get behind this character, because we know the entire story is going to be about them getting revenge. And so we have to feel it too. We have to desire it too. And even though it's extremely familiar, often we fall for it. We fall for it and we love it. At least I love it. I'm a huge sucker for revenge films, even though they're incredibly repetitive. That was the feeling I was hoping to get here with Annabelle and her father. I was hoping to get behind their plight, but there's something about her father surviving that just, I don't know. He, he didn't seem to be in a bad way, really, outside of being in jail, but, you know, whatever. I didn't get a sense of danger for him. I didn't get a sense that there was a ticking clock, that Annabelle really needed to go retrieve this canister of her, for, of her mother's voice to do anything, just, I guess, make him feel better. But anyway, she finds two more people. There's this guy, and she kind of blackmails to go along with him, as well as another woman. And so they go off on this quest. They go into the uh, the wastelands of Mars, or you might say, the dunes of Mars, the dunes of Mars. And one of the first things she sees is a strange many-legged, like worm-like creature. Hmm. A worm-like creature in dunes, in dunes. Yeah. But Balangred kind of fixes it a little bit. I'm not going to spoil it for you. You'll discover it while you read it. But further, she delves into the wasteland. She goes somewhere else. And um, this last part, I, I was a huge sucker for, even though, again, I could smell the inspiration coming from miles and miles away, and that is uh, Jeff Vandermeer's The Southern Reach. And so while, like I said, I'm a sucker for that kind of material, it was pretty obvious to me what was going on here. And one thing I can say, at least about Nathan Ballingred's novel, The Strange, is that while it's not original, it had a lot of, <laughs> a lot of stuff I like. You know, I, I love Westerns. Uh, I love, of course, Martian Chronicles. I don't love the book Dune, but I, I love the setting. I, I love the world building. I, I love the visuals of it. And of course, the Southern Reach trilogy. Of course, I Robot by As Isaac Asimov. So it had all these things I love, but it just felt too derivative for me. So even though I was kind of 
grinning, you know, here and there while I was reading these things. I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let the fact go that this just felt like a collection of things that just didn't come together in a unique voice. But the plot does move quick. This isn't a very long book. I never found myself getting bored just frustrated, you might say. So if you are ignorant of any of these properties or you don't mind heavy, heavy inspiration, I think plot won't get in the way too much for you. All right, let's talk about the writing next, or as I like to call it, the cinematography of the novel. Generally speaking, this is a well-written novel. On the surface, on the surface, but I have a couple of caveats to talk about because, you know, I, I like to read deeply. I like to see the subtext. I like to see the music. I like to feel the music of the writing. And the first sour note is with the voice, let's say. So we know that um, this takes place in 1931. Granted, she's writing it as an old woman, so I don't know, maybe it's like the 80s or the 90s, something like that. But in the beginning of the novel, I would say the first third of the novel, Valangrud is really leaning into the Western themes. Not only in the way that Annabelle is recounting the story to us through the narrative, but also in the dialogue, the way the characters speak. However, he kind of loses it after about a third of the novel. It comes and goes. It's inconsistent, really. And it's, it was really surprising to me how an editor could have missed this because he leans really heavily into it and then it just vanishes into thin air. So it led to a very disjointed reading experience. Now, if you're not as picky as me, it's probably not going to get in the way for you. But that's the kind of stuff that really bothers me because I really appreciate when a writer has a consistent voice, he sets a tone and he really goes for it. I felt like Ballingrud here wanted to do something like that and then either lost his way or changed his mind and forgot to go back and edit the first third. The second disappointing thing with the writing is that Annabelle is 14. So I know the story is being told from an old Annabelle, but Annabelle never feels like a 14 year old girl. She always feels like an adult and, and you may be arguing that, well, that's the point. She had to grow up fast because of her circumstances, because of her passive father, et cetera, et cetera. But then I have to ask myself, why did the writer have this event happen to a 14 year old girl? Well, if I had to guess, if I had to guess why he would do this, when you're writing a first person novel from someone who is older, looking back at themselves in hindsight, mind you, when they were younger, you know, it's probably them lament lamenting about some things. It's probably them looking back and thinking, I could have done something better. I, I should have done something different. Look at how foolish I was. Look how ignorant I was. Look how young I was. Look how immature I was. But you never get that sense from old Annabelle. So it never feels like Annabelle is growing as a person throughout the course of the story. Yes, she has some realizations, but it's never reinforced by asides from the person, older Annabelle, who is telling us this story. And so I feel like, Number one, Annabelle could have been an adult. I didn't see it at any point whatsoever for her being a young girl. And also I felt like this novel could have been written in third person. I didn't feel a purpose for the first person voice of an older woman looking back at her life as a child, which is why I'm gonna give The Strange by Nathan Ballingrud a 6.5 out of 10. A novel that had such beautiful potential, one that on paper felt like it was written just for me, but ended up feeling like a collection of homages rather than a blend told with a unique voice, but the setting, one part of my heart anyway. With writing that will definitely get you through it, it's not going to get into the way, but needed some developmental help. I really wanted to love this novel. I hate that I don't love this novel. And it, <laughs> it really hurt me more after I read the acknowledgements. I always read the afterword and the acknowledgements in books because I love just getting the perspective of the author and he really goes deep. He he gave up on this novel for a long time. He, he's he's short story writer by trade. This is his first novel ever. So I can understand the frustration of, of you know, a new format and, and just feeling like you don't know what you're doing. He put the novel down and it was his daughter, his young daughter, who inspired him to pick it up again. And I can tell there's so much love and so much effort put into this book that, <laughs> again, it really disappoints me that I don't love it because I, th there's nothing more than seeing how much a writer puts into their work and just and falling in love with it. It makes it so much better, but it's so much more painful knowing that he put in so much work and, and I didn't feel it. I didn't feel the same story he wanted to tell. But that said, this is his first effort at the longer form story. So I really look forward to what he does next. But that is it for the review. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know, did you read The Strange? Do you wanna read The Strange? Do you disagree with me? And if you would like to see my own work, my own derivative novels inspired by greater writers, you can check the Amazon link down in the description below. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one. Bye.